Laurent Brochard, I'm an intensivist in Toronto, Canada, and I'm co-chairing this session with uh, my friend Luigi Comparata from London, UK. Good morning. Just to be sure, it's not Luciano Gattinoni. Um, Shaved this morning. <laughs> and we have a great session, uh, very exciting and challenging topics on uh, about VV ECMO, what we've learned recently. And our first speaker is uh, Dan Brody from, uh, he was from uh, New York and I think he's uh, from Johns Hopkins in Baltimore now. And talking about obesity is not a contraindication. Uh, merci Laurent. Uh, it is a great pleasure to be here uh, with all of you in person. And uh, I, I hope if people have questions that they'll ask them uh, at the end because uh, this is a topic that I think is very important for all of us to discuss. And, it really stems from an older notion that obesity could be a contraindication to ECMO for ARDS. So uh, these are my uh, disclosures. I will talk about uh, one of our ECMONET studies, and I don't think others are relevant to this talk. So uh, let's talk about obesity. This is what we all know extremely well is that, uh, and this is older data from the WHO, but uh, as of 2017, the prevalence had tripled worldwide. Uh, since 1975, there's 650 million adults just in 2016 uh, with obesity, 13% of the world's population. And it's really the vast majority of overweight or obese uh, children now live in developing countries. Uh, the consequences of obesity, I don't have to repeat them all, they're legion, uh, with all-cause mortality being the ultimate uh, consequence. With greater than 4 million deaths a year, even as of 2017, as a result of overweight and obesity, uh, they've been linked uh, to more deaths worldwide than underweight. Um, within the ICU, we know that there's an increasing population of patients uh, admitted to the ICU who have obesity and early studies associated it with mortality. But then, of course, more recent literature over the last decade has suggested this obesity paradox that perhaps actually they have a better mortality uh, in the ICU. Uh, with respect to ARDS, there's an increased risk for ARDS with lower ARDS-specific mortality, and I think that will come up. Uh, as we begin to discuss this. ECMO for ARDS, I'm not going to get into the data in another talk, but uh, suffice it to say that I think we accept that they're in a, a highly selected population. There's a benefit for these patients, and that it's now part of our standard management algorithm for patients uh, with the most severe forms of ARDS. So this is the primary question. Should obesity be considered a contraindication to ECMO in ARDS? If you go back to some of the older literature, including guidelines, including from ELSO, obesity was considered a relative contraindication, and, and why? Because uh, it, it was said, and it is not entirely untrue, it, it can be dip, difficult to cannulate these patients, uh, difficult to transport and mobilize them, um, and they may have, if, if higher cardiac output, uh, potentially higher requirements for blood flow rates, and there was an assumption of poorer outcomes. Uh, does data actually uh, support excluding patients with obesity uh, and ARDS from ECMO? Um, so first of all, let's look at transport. That was one of the issues that was brought up. This is from my former center where Michael Salna led us in this single center study of 222 patients. 63 were obese, 28 had a BMI greater than uh, or equal to 46, greater than or equal to 50, and there were no deaths during transport and BMI was not a predictor of in-hospital mortality. What about cannulation? Yet another issue that's been raised. Uh, in this uh, single center study from Regensburg, looking at their experience from uh, 2006 to 2016, 153 patients with a BMI greater than 35, uh, and there was no difference in outcomes or complications. Uh, I just want to look briefly, this is really a talk about VV ECMO and ARDS, but just let's see if there's a signal in VA ECMO. Um, here in this study of 244 patients with VA ECMO for cardiogenic shock, there was no significant difference except for they noted an increased mortality in the class 2 obesity patients, BMI of 35 to 40. Uh, this uh, study of 355 patients showed no significant difference in survival. And here again from my former center with Michael Salma, uh, 431 patients overall survival was 48% with no difference based on BMI with a, a signal in the eCPR patients who had a BMI greater than 35. So what about eCPR? Uh, this uh, single center study uh, looked at 200 patients but only had 15 with a BMI of 30 or more and it was not associated with mortality. So, they, this is a lot of observational data that really only shows signals. Uh, what about obesity and VV ECMO? This is from uh, Zach Cohn and colleagues. Uh, 55 patients, they, they show that the uh, survival to hospital discharge 
was 67% if you had a BMI greater than 40 and 58% if less than 40, again, small population. Um, all six patients with a BMI greater than 50 survived. Uh, here, 194 patients with VV ECMO and no difference in survival. Uh, this, in this study, a mixed population, 233 patients, VA and VV, uh, no difference in 30-day uh, survival, but, uh, increased risk of bleeding with peripheral VA cannulation. So uh, what about specific to COVID-19? Uh, as that recedes, we uh, sometimes feel a little bit less worried about it, but there was a lot that we learned from that population. Um, here, a, a single center study of 76 patients, uh, 90 day survival was 51% and the uh, higher BMI was associated again in this small study with higher 90 day survival. Uh, here, uh, Martin Ballack led this uh, single center study of 119 patients, 58% uh, were obese uh, and, uh, and there was no difference in survival. So overall with a slight signal of maybe improvement in survival, this, this, these single center observational studies don't really suggest that much of a difference. Uh, what about multi-center studies? This uh, from Korea, 84 patients, but they split them uh, between BMI less than uh, 25 and greater than or equal to 25, and only 26 were greater than or equal to 25. So there's not much that we can conclude. They did show that uh, there was a higher survival in the higher BMI, but I'm not sure this really counts as the obesity paradox. Uh, larger databases, this from the United States, what's called the Nationwide Readmissions Database. Uh, Payman Benarash does a lot of work with this database and looked at, uh, his group looked at 23,000 patients um, and obesity was not associated with increased odds of mortality, uh, which was their hypothesis. The COVID-19 Critical Care Consortium uh, from John Fraser's group in Brisbane, uh, this uh, study led by Jeff Javidfar looked at uh, 82 uh, cases of ARDS for VV ECMO uh, 82 centers, excuse me, 354 patients stratified by BMI less than or equal to or greater than 40. And higher BMI in this study was actually associated with higher mortality. Uh, what about larger uh, databases? This is an early study by Priya Nair's group uh, looking at the ELSA registry, 1,300 patients. This is a long time ago. Uh, these are patients through 2011. Uh, no significant difference in in-hospital mortality based on body weight, not BMI, um, and no difference in the H1N1 population. And that brings us to this study, and if you haven't seen it, I suggest if you're interested in this topic that you look at it. This was a terrific study uh, by Petermans and colleagues. It was published in ICM in the last year, uh, looking at the ELSO registry uh, between 2010 and 2020 uh, for the impact of BMI greater than or equal to 35. Uh, 18,000 patients in total, and uh, BMI of uh, greater than or equal to 35 was associated with decreased in hospital mortality. They looked at propensity mat score matching, inverse propensity score weighted models, and multivariable models, and all of those that held true uh, with a decreased length of stay for these patients. Uh, they looked for a relationship between BMI and uh, outcomes, uh, which they showed was nonlinear, and they couldn't find any cutoff for what they would consider futility for putting these patients on ECMO. There are a few issues. It was an outstanding study, but a few issues to be addressed. One is that the registry had significant missing data, um, as can often be the case in these registry studies. It was a heterogeneous population, not just ARDS, but all respiratory failure, which uh, mostly ARDS, but still not entirely. Um, and they didn't use a BMI cutoff of 30, so we don't have information on those patients. Rather, they chose class 2 obesity as the cutoff. Which brings us to um, an upcoming multi-center study called the ECMO Obesity Study. Uh, this is one of our ECMONET studies uh, led by Daria Rudem and uh, Tai Pham, along with uh, Matthew Schmidt. We've looked at an international multi-center retrospective cohort uh, for the as association between obesity and mortality in ECMO for ARDS. Uh, and this is unpublished data. So this is uh, the association using BMI cutoff of uh, 30 or more in the WHO definitions of obesity, looking at ICU mortality, 774 patients, uh, so the largest uh, observational study to date, uh, 320 with obesity, and this is 2012 through 2017, the data's been delayed by uh, the pandemic. Um, and we initially excluded underweight patients, but they'll actually likely be included in the final analysis. The data comes from the University of Milan in Italy, uh, Columbia University in New York in the United States, Duke University in North Carolina in the United States, and the Assistance Publique Hôpital uh, de Paris in France. Um, along with the lifeguard study, which is from 23 ICUs and from 10 countries, that's Matthew Schmidt's data. So uh, we looked at multivariable logistic regression, propensity score matching, and we looked at BMI as a continuous variable, looking for a cutoff uh, with uh, one kilogram per meter squared and three kilogram per meter squared uh, as, the, uh, as the variables. 
Um, and we were looking for a continuous association between BMI and mortality and we, using uh, penalized linear spines, splines so that we could allow for nonlinear associations. The primary outcome is ICU mortality. And so here's the mortality. With obesity, 24.1%. Without obesity, 34.8%, uh, with an adjusted odds ratio of 0.6. Um, BMI is a continuous variable and multivariable regression. Higher BMI was associated with decreased ICU mortality. Uh, this held true in propensity score matching of 258 of the patients with and without obesity, uh, with 22.5% uh, versus 36.4% mortality, again, lower in the, in the obese patients. So again, we used uh, penalized linear splines uh, and uh, modeled after this. We found sort of a vaguely U-shaped curve, but if you look at the confidence intervals, they're really quite wide, so I'm not sure that we can make a claim there. Um, but the lowest risk of death plateaued between a BMI of 50 and 55 uh, for what that's worth. So if you compare this with the ELSA registry study, the relationship between BMI and outcomes was uh, nonlinear. Uh, in the registry study, with the, the highest mortality in a BMI of 30 to 35, in uh, our ECMO obesity study, the highest mortality appears to have perhaps been less than 25 and greater than 55, although I would say that with uh, a, a large caveat. Secondary outcomes, there were no differences in ICU or hospital length of stay, duration of mechanical ventilation or ECMO uh, days, ECMO-free days at 90 days, uh, although patients with obesity did have fewer ventilator-free days and hospital-free days. So what I would say is that ECMO, with ECMO, ECMO for ARDS, patients with obesity had lower ICU mortality than patients without obesity, and that held true in multivariable and propensity score matching analyses. So is this then the obesity paradox? And what do we mean by obesity paradox? There are many theories that are out there from experts in the field. Uh, among them are a preconditioning cloud, transformation of adipos, uh, adipose macrophages, and higher nutritional stores. I think more germane to these patients are the specific factors that might impact the patients with ARDS. They have increased chest wall elastance, which may mitigate villi. Um, higher plateau pressures are generated with similar vent settings in these obese patients because of their uh, decreased chest wall compliance. So that in and of itself might prompt the clinicians who see the higher plateau pressures, again, not related to uh, the transpulmonary pressures of the lungs, might lower the pressures and volumes of the ventilator because they're reacting to the higher plateau. And um, in that sense, plateau pressure is a poor surrogate for transpulmonary pressure, but because we're reacting to it, we might actually be treating them with relatively lower volumes and pressures compared to their transpulmonary pressure. Uh, when they have very specific ARDS, they have increased pleural pressure, decreased functional residual capacity, and increased atelectasis. And I think this is really one of the key elements. The severity or so-called severity of ARDS may be relatively overestimated in these patients um, because of the degree of atelectasis that they have it, as measured by P to F. So P to F may not be the best surrogate because we're only measuring hypoxemia. They're going to be more hypoxemic with more atelectasis. So at comparable P to F ratios, these patients might actually have less severe ARDS. Right? Um, and the atelectasis may actually be more reversible, and we see this in a lot of our obese patients. And so perhaps we're simply under, underutilizing uh, PEEP, but the mortality uh, could be less than expected. If you look at uh, the median PEEP in our study, patients with obesity was 15 and patients without obesity was 13. So there's not much difference uh, in those patients, and perhaps that really is a signal that we have an opportunity to use more PEEP to make them their ARDS so-called less severe, and they wouldn't necessarily qualify for ECMO. And so if we take out that subset that has less severe ARDS, that might account for some of the difference in mortality. Um, this is a very nice paper suggesting such a phenomenon uh, by Salvatore Grasso uh, and Marco Ranieri. Uh, this is uh, 14 patients with influenza AH1N1 associated ARDS who were referred for ECMO. They did esophageal pressure monitor, monitoring, targeting uh, transpulmonary pressure close to the upper physiologic limit, and there were seven patients who were near that limit who received ECMO. But for those patients who were below the limit, they received more PEEP until they reached that pressure limit, uh, and then the oxygenation improved and they all avoided ECMO. So perhaps these patients going on ECMO may not need ECMO if we were able to give them more PEEP. Maybe they are less severe, and that might account for some of the difference between them. So is it the ICU uh, obesity paradox, or are we overcalling the severity of ARDS in patients with obesity and potentially underutilizing PEEP prior to initiating ECMO? So uh, in the end, ob obesity really may complicate cannulation, transport, and mobilization, and that can definitely be true, and that is certainly true in select patients and at some centers, depending on level of experience. 
Um, but in my opinion, obesity should not be considered in and of itself a contraindication to ECMO for ARDS. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dan. Uh, great presentation. We have uh, time for a couple of questions. Um, just a comment, maybe. I, I completely agree with the uh, physiology about uh, higher um, pleural pressure and more atelectasis. I don't think uh, the chest wall compliance is, is an issue. Uh, every, every time it has been measured, it's normal. So when you put a heavy book on your chest, you do have a higher pressure in your chest, but it's still uh, the same force needed to move it. So it doesn't change compliance, but it changes the pleural pressure for sure. Yeah. I think your point about uh, that the, the, uh, for the same PF ratio, they may be less severe in terms of lung injury it makes sense. Yeah. <laughs> and just a question uh, about the pre-selection of patients in all this observational study, aren't, mm. is there a risk that you know, the obese and complicated patients are not sent to ECMO, and so you see the best of the obese patients? Uh, so absolutely. So we, I mean, I, I think for sure, regardless of what we say, people will consider obesity you know, in, as a factor weighing against the patient uh, for ECMO, which again is what I'm trying to convince you we probably should not do, with you know, definite exceptions in some of the patients. So we may be selecting for the best of them, and yet selecting uh, for uh, patients who also maybe are not as severe. Dan, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent presentation. One second, I've got a little, little question for you, Dan. <laughs> Retrograde. I mean, it's, I, I completely agree with you about the not, you know, not using it as an inclusion criterion. But I wonder whether, um, you know, whether there are any data on the functional ability of the, some of these patients, because obesity might be a frail tissue, might be a um, situation where it can affect their long-term um, rehabilitation and, and going back to work. So maybe looking at survivorship rather than survival might be interesting in this population. What do you think? Uh, I mean, that's, I could not agree more. And I, I think that's all of critical care writ large. We, in general, have to stop looking at ICU mortality as an outcome. Uh, it's only meaningful to some extent, and it's barely patient-centered. How are our patients surviving? And no, we don't have any data related to that. That's what we're relying on Carol Hodgson and others uh, to begin to get us uh, over time. But that's on all of us to begin to uh, get that data, because as you say, that, that is really what's important. And, and you know, just getting these patients to survive, maybe they're not surviving well because they are more difficult to mobilize and so on. But with experience, all of that can be done. So as I say, for now, I think based on the data we have, I would not consider this a contraindication. Thank you very much. <laughs> now it's my, my pleasure to welcome uh, Marco Ranieri on the podium from University of Bologna. He's going to talk about age limits uh, revisited. Uh, thanks, Marco. Thank you very much. Now, uh, we all know in our practice that age can influence uh, in a bad way any treatment because of the associated comorbidity, because of the patient's reduced biological ability to recover, certainly from ECMO, but that's in general terms applied to any advanced tre treatment in the critical settings. And if you put the evidence together, some evidence are suggesting that for ECMO there is an age limit for uh, more than 65 years of age. And this is a sort of common sense if you talk to clinician in your practice. You now the first thing they ask when you refer a patient for ECMO or where somebody is referring a patient for ECMO to you is, how old is he? Now, let me uh, review with you, first of all, the, the evidence we have, the top evidence we have. And let me start with the CSER trial, the first randomized control trial performed on ECMO now more than 10 years ago, 15 years ago, showing a signal, a clear signal in favor of ECMO. And if you look at the age, here you see the limit of 65 years of age. 
So patients were included, 40% of the patients were in the range between 46 and 65 years of age. This is the H1N1 uh, period. So this is the report from the UK network. And again, also in this case series, you see that that's the limit that was applied in general terms to accept the patient for ECMO. Same picture for France. Actually here, the uh, average uh, age of patients included into this data set is 42 plus or minus 13 years of age, so even less than the 65 limit. This is the Italian network experience during H1N1. And again, 55 to 35 years of age was the, the range of the age of patients admitted to ECMO. And this is the, the, the best evidence we have available in terms of randomized control trial, the uh, study published in the New England by Alain Combe. And here you see, again, 50 plus or minus 14 years of age. So in a way, in this randomized control trial, we see a tendency in accepting into I mean, this is the randomized control trial, it's not real life, but the inclusion criteria of this randomized control trial, did not, the exclusion criteria did not have age as a factor, and we will see the implication of this. And the same thing nowadays with COVID-19, this is one of the several case series that we published in the recent uh, last time, and you see that again, the average uh, age of patients admitted to ECMO is within the limit of 40 to 55, 60 years of age. So except the randomized control trial that did not have a limit in terms of inclusion criteria for age and allowed a, a wider range of age in, as uh, patients included into the study, Reviewing the literature, is this what we do in clinical studies? And in gen general terms, we may say that this is what we do in clinical practice. There are few studies that have systematically analyzed the impact of age in predicting outcome in patients on ECMO. This is one of them where you see a significant signal in terms of age as an independent factor uh, explaining the risk of death. And this is probably one of the, how can I say, more clear paper going into the direction of the limit of 65 years of age. You see here the Kaplan-Meier curve in a series of patients going classified by age, 45, 45, 54, 55, 64, and older than 64. And you see that the age older than 64 is associated with a clear difference in terms of Kaplan-Meier survival curve. Nevertheless, commenting this paper, my friends from Monza sent a letter to the journal saying essentially that they review, triggered by these data, they review their own data, and they found an acceptable mortality rate of 56% in patients older than 65 years of age. Acceptable mortality rate. And that in their opinion, narrowing ECMO indication based on age and based on that limit age was not appropriated. And that a clinical evaluation, a, a overall clinical evaluation of the patient taking into consideration comorbidities, the performance of the patient before the onset of acute respiratory failure would have been more appropriate in this context. And therefore, they concluded saying that they would not accept, and they actually they did not accept that limit age in their clinical practice. If you look at the guidelines of the health organization, you don't see any limit. And this is probably the, the, the most uh, solid uh, evidence, not evidence, guidelines and suggestions that we have from uh, a very well-known ECMO organization. And there are several reasons why the ELSO did not specify any age threshold for ECMO. First of all, because mortality in patients over than 65 years of age 
wide range. I mean, it, it's extremely variable in the study, from less than 50% to more than 80%. And that if you review the recent, all the recent ECMO score, none of them is consistently using a single age limit. And again, the recent randomized control trial does not include age as an exclusion criteria. And in, as a matter of fact, this is a very nice uh, review from Christian, published on, uh, on intensive care medicine a number of years ago, where if you look at the evolution of ECMO mortality over the years, you see a stable signal. But if you look at the evolution of the age of patients admitted to the treatment of ECMO, you can see that there is a clear trend in the clinical practice to include older patients for the treatment with ECMO. So we, we, we said, and actually I had the possibility to discuss the, this during several ECMO, the ECMO net meetings, but it is possible that we, we don't end up review, systematically reviewing the evidence to some sort of knee in the mortality age relationship. I mean, that, that, it should make sense so we run this meta-analysis, including all studies that match the number of criteria, clinical study, all of them, that included patients who had ARDS, according to the Berlin definition, treated with VECMO. The study has to enroll at least six patients, and they had to have data regarding ICU mortality. If ICU mortality was not available, we contacted the sites and trying to get this data. And here you have the, uh, the flowchart of the selection of studies. And the end, we were able to select using those criteria, 140 studies. And here you have the relationship between age and in-hospital mortality. Now, this is the windows where we have most of the data, most of the study, between 45 and 55. Now, if you exclude the two clearly outliers where you have a mortality equal zero and a mortality higher than 80%, you can see that the extreme variability that you observe in a systematic review of the available data. There is no inflection point in this relationship. There is a linear relationship, and the linear relationship is associated to a cloud of points. Of course, uh, there are problems in analyzing this data. The small amount of randomized clinical trial, the inconsistent results from observational studies, and the fact that most of these studies are including uh, case series or study design that did not allow patients older than 65, 70 to be included into the study. So we don't have enough data to systematically analyze the impact of age at the extreme end of age in terms of outcome. So that's my last slide. Because since there is a linear relationship, since we don't have a threshold, given the fact that we must say yes or no to an ECMO treatment based on age, looking at the patient, looking at the clinical history, looking at the the quality of life of this subject before the indication of ECMO. What is the acceptable mortality? Is 60%, 55% mortality, as in the case series of my friend and colleague from Monza, acceptable? Of course, it depends pretty much on the context. During the COVID-19, the answer would be no. In other contexts, the answer would be yes. But here, where we are limited. So until we don't have better data, I agree with, with, with what Dan said. As for obesity, age is not an absolute contraindication for ECMO. By the way, I'm 63. If you don't put me on ECMO if I need it, I sue you. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much for your uh, talk. Um, any questions? Oh, Carol. I can probably just yell. The um, microphone is coming. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm very loud. I couldn't say it by now. That's, um, that's coming. 
As per the question from the previous talk, I guess the question is not just about survival with older patients, it's about the fact that they're less likely to have a good functional recovery. And I just wondered whether age has any consideration when you're thinking not just about whether the patient will get back out of hospital, but whether they'll return to their family or return to their previous place of living and their quality of life. Unfortunately, as Dan was alluding before, we don't have uh, substantial and, and robust evidence allow me to answer to your question. So I learned that without scientific data, we are left with a clinical evaluation. And again, I think if you have a 70 years old person who had a very good quality of life before acute respiratory failure, who was totally independent with blah, 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 blah. I would not deny the right to, for ECMO treatment. But if you accept this concept, you have to also to accept the concept. If you have a 40 years old who is severely obese, was not independent, was uh, with A, B, C, and D of comorbidity, even if the age of was 40, you would not put him on ECMO or her on ECMO if you accept this, this, this limits of thinking. Oh. Thank you. I mean, w the other thing to, I was wondering what your thoughts were. So obviously treatment, uh, sort of uh, ECMO is a tool uh, to um, decrease sort of the attributable mortality that we give to mechanical ventilation. And is there any signal in, in the literature about the treatment effect of ECMO uh, over time, so that there is quite a, some literature that might suggest a reduction in uh, in treatment effect over the ages. You know, uh. I mean, review. I mean, again, the quality of the studies that we uh, evaluated for this meta-analysis is extremely low, extremely low, and we have to take this into consideration because our field, since the last 10 years where there was a clear uh, takeoff in terms of quality of studies uh, related to ECMO is based on very poor quality of data. And, and I mean, we have to take this into consideration. There are very few good studies where you have data collected prospectively with a good statistical analysis plan, and then it's very poor, the quality of data we have. Thank you, Laurent. Yeah, Marco, in, um, in critical care in general, people have proposed to um, shift from age to frailty score or something like that because of this problem. So uh, I, I suppose you don't have uh, a lot of data about that and, uh, and whether you think it's, uh, it's appropriate in the future to to look at frailty instead of age. Look, I think the ECMONET is one of the hypotheses that should test. I mean, we need to change the perspective in this context because all we have is coming from very bad quality data. And, but this, uh, what we have, the consequences of this, it has a huge impact. Again, in my clinical practice, the first thing that I, I hear when somebody refers a patient for ECMO is how old is he? Mm -hmm. Know how well he is. How old is he? 65. Mm. That's why I said, if you don't put me on ECMO, I sue you. No. So we need more data and we need good data for this to, to stop this kind of question. Any questions, observation? I mean, going back to the clinical frailty score, I mean, we used in the UK clinical frailty score to, um, as a proxy of a combination of things, including age, obesity, and other things. But I think the validation of clinical frailty score is a difficult, is a difficult thing, particularly in the, um, in the population overall. And I think I, I agree with you, we might, need, we might need further data. Maybe Carol will tell us a little bit more later on about uh, how we can change our practices using uh, observational data. Any other, any other? Fantastic. Well, in that case, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. My pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Antoine Vieillard Baron from uh, uh, Boulogne, uh, France, uh, who is going to talk about uh, considering the right ventricular function.
Thank you. Thank you, Laurent. Good morning, everyone. So I do not have any conflict of uh, interest for this, uh, for this lecture. Uh, uh, probably you are thinking for yourself, this guy is clearly a fanatic of uh, right ventricle. Uh, I have to say that's true. But uh, I, I will w want to convince you that this is especially important in the field of ARDS when we are discussing which kind of patient we are to select for VV ECMO. So first, because the right ventricular failure is frequent in RDS, especially when it is severe, and this is associated with the outcome. Look at probably, you know, this, uh, this uh, study. It was a large cohort of moderate to severe RDS patients. 22% uh, of them had the right ventricular overload. And just to show you the different risk factors for developing uh, RV overload, it was pneumonia as cause of RDS. It was a driving pressure of 18 centimeters of water of above, a PNF ratio below 150, and a PCO2 of uh, uh, higher than 48 or above. And what was especially interesting in this study is that more uh, risk factor patients had, uh, more likely uh, they had to develop right ventricular overload. And uh, maybe if we just think that patient that could be eligible for VV ECMO could uh, reach uh, three or four risk factors, you see that uh, uh, we have uh, between 30 to 70% of patients with right ventricular overload, which is uh, far uh, to be all the patients. So probably there is something to evaluate in this subgroup of patients about the uh, eligibility for VV ECMO. It was non-COVID-19 patients. It was uh, published before the pandemic. Here you have data uh, coming from the Limoges group, uh, now regarding moderate to severe RDS, so same kind of population, but related to COVID-19 patients. It was a prospective uh, uh, study, and they analyzed the right ventricular function in 140 patients. Just look at the uh, uh, factors uh, which were associated with the uh, outcome in this study. Uh, the age, and we had a, a good discussion just before, uh, the SAPS2, uh, uh, an history of ischemic cardiomyopathy, and right ventricular failure. And here in this study, right ventricular failure was defined as an association between RV dilatation using the echo and congestion uh, uh, using the CVP. So this is the first point for me, which is quite well uh, established. The second point I want to discuss is that uh, VV, uh, ECMO improves RV function. We have some data. This uh, one is not uh, really new. It was published in the Blue Journal in 2015. Just to uh, uh, show that uh, when they uh, uh, cannulated the patient, you can uh, see that very quickly, it's not a scoop, that the blood gas analysis improved. So the PaO2 uh, increased and the PCO2 decreased. But which was uh, especially interesting in this study, but it doesn't work. Yes, is that you can see the, the black square is the uh, mean pulmonary artery pressure. And so you observe very quickly in a few minutes a decrease in the pulmonary hypertension just applying the VV ECMO. And it was responsible or associated with an improvement in hemodynamics. And now this is the uh, black square. This is the SVO2. You observe an increase in the SVO2, reflecting a much better uh, oxygen extraction at the, at the tissue, a better uh, the oxygen delivery, sorry. So look at uh, in COVID-19, uh, we have some uh, uh, preliminary data. So this paper is in press uh, still in the blue. So this is a, a cohort of uh, more than 150 uh, uh, COVID-19 patients on VV ECMO. But there is a very small subgroup of patients, only 15 patients, but these patients were very uh, well uh, evaluated using the echo, with an echo uh, below the, implement, uh, the cannulation, so this is the blue bar. After one day, uh, this is the white bar, and after three days, this is the red bar. And on the left, you have the a parameter of coupling between the right ventricle and the pulmonary circulation. And you see that very quickly, in a few hours, the coupling uh, was improved. And on the right, you have a parameter using strain, a, a complicated uh, echo technique, uh, 
which is a parameter of intrinsic contraction of the right ventricle. And once again, you see very quickly an improvement in the RV systolic function just applying VV ECMO. So the third point I want now to discuss is that the EOLIA-based criteria are probably not selective enough, especially uh, during an ICU surge when we have so many patients that could be eligible for VV ECMO. Just to show you here this uh, interesting data published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, uh, you have the, the, the curve is the evolution of the number of centers which are uh, uh, capable to do uh, ECMO from uh, uh, 1990 to uh, uh, 2019. You can see that it starts increasing after the uh, H H1N1, so after the, uh, 2009, and the bar represents the number of uh, ECMO runs. You have the same evolution. But what is interesting is that you reach a plateau uh, uh, since a few years, you cannot increase uh, definitively probably the number of centers and the number of ECMO runs. And more interesting, there is uh, some health inequities. And you have the evolution of the number of centers uh, uh, according to the different uh, world area. So it was the increase was mostly supported by the increase in North America. This is the purple uh, color. Uh, the Europe, the, the light blue is not so bad, but quite, quite stabilized. But look at, for instance, in Latin America, you have only a few centers who are capable to uh, apply VV ECMO. If you look at data about the uh, uh, RV function and the eligibility of patients for uh, ECMO, just look at this uh, sub-study we did uh, from our large cohort of more than 700 patients, moderate to severe RDS, but non-COVID-19. Only 9% of them uh, uh, met the OLIA criteria. So we could only discuss VV ECMO in only 9% of these patients. If you look at now some preliminary data, we have only submitted, not yet published. This is retrospective data, multicenter data, in uh, 283 uh, moderate to severe RDS related to COVID-19. You can see now that you, you are close to 68% of patients who met the EOLIA criteria. So in whom you have to discuss maybe to uh, cannulate the patients, which is a big difference, especially when you have this kind of surge with uh, a potential shortage of devices. The problem is that right now, and I am not the expert of the field, probably Dan is much better than me, not probably, sure, surely. Uh, there, there is no model really to predict in which patient you have to uh, accumulate uh, to improve the prognosis. I, I really like this study, uh, which is a, a systematic review of the uh, prediction model that we may have. Uh, if you look at the literature, you have around uh, 58 prediction models, but only uh, uh, 24 of them uh, had an external validity. You have some here, the save, the resp, the preserve, or some much uh, uh, less uh, simple models uh, based on the SOFA, the APH2, or the SEPS2. And the conclusion of this study is that current models are unsuitable to provide decision support for selecting individuals in, wo in whom initi initiation of ECMO will be most beneficial for two reasons. First, they were developed in ECMO uh, patients only. And second, probably more importantly, the they were uh, did when the decision to start ECMO already been made. So that's really difficult to have prediction model in this kind of very selected population already eligible for ECMO and already uh, uh, cannulated. So uh, how may uh, RV function evaluation could help to improve the selection of these uh, uh, patients? If you look at the first uh, so study, non-COVID-19, uh, among the 9% of patients who were eligible to ECMO, we only uh, implemented uh, eight of them, which uh, regards 12% of this subgroup, because it was the usual practice of these uh, centers. Just to show you that uh, uh, if you look at the RV evaluation between the two groups, 
those patients without the ECMO criteria and those with the ECMO criteria, it was very expected that the right ventricle was much bigger, much more dilated in ECMO criteria patients. The systolic pulmonary artery pressure was higher and we had much more severe RV uh, overloading and ov I, I will say overall, we had much more severe RV overload, 42% compared to 20%. It's not very interesting data. This is the most severe patient, so as expected, we have more RV loading. But what could be uh, interesting was the factors associated in this study with the outcome. The NICU mortality was 36%, and it was 35 in the non-ECMO, uh, in the uh, non-EOLIA uh, patients compared to 46. It was not significant, but the study was definitively not designed to look at this uh, uh, comparison. But what was interesting that the factors so associated with the outcome, only uh, the severe right ventricular dilatation, so when the right ventricle was bigger than the left, and the driving pressure. So an association of respiratory mechanics and RV uh, function. If you look at our preliminary data now in COVID-19 uh, uh, IRDS, so we only uh, cannulated 9% among of patients who could be eligible for uh, ECMO based on the earlier criteria, once again be because of the usual care and because maybe of the surge in our ICUs. The in-hospital mortality was 36%. It was 44 in the uh, uh, most of patients eligible uh, for ECMO based on the earlier criteria. And the mortality was similar between those who uh, had uh, ECMO and those who did not have ECMO. Just to show you that from this data, we try to put uh, to do a clustering analysis. So putting in, in the machine many different informations, epidemiologic data, including the age, uh, respiratory mechanics, blood gas analysis. So the worst blood gas within the seven days following the uh, diagnosis, diagnosis of ARDS and uh, parameter of RV function, which were recorded uh, the day or just around uh, the worst uh, blood gas uh, analysis. And it was interesting that we were able to uh, uh, differentiate three different uh, uh, kind of patients, three different clusters, and especially the cluster three, it was now only 29% of patients that could be maybe eligible for VV ECMO compared to 68 if you just apply the earlier criteria. And they are a very uh, particular mortality, uh, which was day 19 mortality of 58%. And after adjustment, this uh, cluster was still associated with the uh, outcome and especially the uh, day 19 mortality. If you look at the characteristic of this cluster, so you have indeed, uh, without any surprise, some uh, parameters associated with blood gases. So a much lower PONF, a much higher PCO2. But you have also a parameter based on respiratory mechanics, a much higher plateau pressure and driving pressure. So I have to say that in the uh, clustering, we also included the BMI, but uh, not reported here in the table. But we, have, uh, we had also interesting uh, data regarding the right ventricular function and the pulmonary circulation, much more dilated RV, and here, the pulmonary acceleration is something like a surrogate of the level of the pulmonary hypertension, so a shortening of this pulmonary acceleration time, reflecting more pulmonary hypertension in these patients. So to conclude on time, and uh, I, am, uh, I am very okay, uh, patient selection for VV ECMO is still unknown, as still in my understanding, or the best selection. Current models fail to predict which patients we need to cannulate. During ICU surge, it is clearly unfeasible to select patients only on AOLIA criteria. Right ventricular overload is clearly a part of the problem, as it is frequently an, uh, a frequent sorry, and associated with mortality in the most severe patients, and it may be corrected just by a VV ECMO. A specific subgroup of patients with a particular high mortality could be defined by associating respiratory and right ventricular data. And further studies, much better design, should be test, uh, should test sorry, this hypothesis. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Antoine, for... Um
uh, maybe uh, adding a new challenge to uh, the, the current approach to VV ECMO. Any uh, questions or comments or discussion? I, I noticed in one of your last slides that the uh, uh, right ventricular diameter, uh, RV to LV, was not very discriminative because it was also high in the, in the cluster one. So, which would mean that, because this is the simplest way to approach the RV uh, uh, function, so it, it means it would need a very detailed uh, evaluation of RV function, right? Yeah, to, to, good, good, uh, good uh, observation. Uh, two, two answers maybe to your comment, uh, Laurent. Uh, the first one, by definition, this kind of clustering analysis, you have an overlap between groups. This is, I mean, not possible to completely discriminate uh, the different clusters. So this is a limitation of this kind of approach. I, I am not an expert of statistics, but I think that we have other statistical techniques to address this limitation. And the uh, second thing is uh, more uh, related to how we evaluate the RV function. Probably that uh, the best way right now is not very well characterized and not very, very well known. And it could be probably much better to have, as I show you initially in the lecture, the association of the RV size plus the CVP. But in this uh, retrospective study, uh, we had two missing uh, CVP values. So it was not possible to include the CVP into the, um, into the clustering analysis. Anton, can I ask a question? I mean, obviously very interesting uh, data and um, it just adds a little bit to the possible indication for ECMO having a uh, right ventricular dilatation of this function. I just was interested in your model and wondering, given the um, association between driving pressure, right ventricular dysfunction, driving pressure and mortality on ECMO, how much do you think the detailed study of the RV uh, adds to the discrimination of the clusters and whether we can just um, use some other parameters to say all likelihood this is right ventricular dysfunction, we should go for uh, ECMO. Yeah, uh, I can't completely answer to the question. Uh, what I can tell you is that uh, the, the driving pressure is associated with RV overload. As I show you, this is very well established. But uh, if you look at precisely the diagram that I show you according to the different risk factors, even if you have all the risk factors, including the driving pressure, your chance to have a right ventricular overloading is only 70%. So this is far to be 100% of patients. So it means that you have 30% of patients with high driving pressure, but no right ventricular overload. I think this is a pilot approach we need to, to complete and to understand much better, but uh, probably that evaluating the right ventricular function to, could add something else only to the driving pressure. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. And now it's my pleasure to welcome uh, Alain Com, um, who will going to talk about how we use ECMO for severe COVID-19. Thank you. Yeah, that's also so uh, hello, everybody, Mr. Chairman. Uh, so how actually we did use ECMO because, uh, as Antoine told you, we might have a look at the right ventricle, but now we're good going to have a look at what we actually did uh, during these uh, two years and a half. So this is my disclosure slide. Uh, well, so uh, just three years ago now, it was March uh, 2020, we got these first results from uh, Wuhan, uh, China. The first uh, patients with uh, those uh, severe uh, COVID-19 pneumonia were hospitalized in uh, uh, hospitals. And there's quite a few patients who did receive uh, ECMO at that time. And the first results were actually very bad with a mortality uh, which was summarized in that short letter, which was close to 100%. So, uh, well, uh, it was the time the uh, pandemic came to uh, Europe, first Italy, then France, uh, England, uh, and then came across the Atlantic. 
And uh, just uh, three years ago, in mid-March uh, 2020, we gathered a group in uh, the greater uh, Paris uh, to define what might be uh, the indication for uh, ECMO uh, in uh, this uh, uh, pandemic situation and uh, facing a potential shortage uh, of uh, uh, equipment and ICU beds as well. So basically, uh, we stuck to this uh, algorithm which was published a couple of weeks before, uh, which, uh, well, uh, recommended uh, ECMO basically on the uh, EOLIA uh, entry uh, criteria. I will not come into detail here, but was mainly on the uh, EOLIA uh, entry uh, criteria. What we did is probably to stress and to make the uh, uh, contra indication a bit more strict that it was the case for EOLIA, especially in terms of age. There was no age limit in EOLIA. Here we limited age to 65 to 70, and over the months we tended to decrease uh, this age limit. Also massive obesity, severe comorbidities, because we had uh, data from uh, meta-analysis post EOLIA showing that uh, uh, when there was more than three organ failing at the time of ECMO initiation, the mortality went very high and probably was no benefit of ECMO. Same for severe immunocompromised patients, uh, of course, patients with cardiac arrest. Uh, MV duration was also uh, uh, clearly associated with a uh, uh, higher uh, uh, rate of uh, failure post uh, uh, ECMO. And once again, those patients with multiple organ failure. So, this is what we did, and uh, this is what we did during the first weeks of the pandemic in the spring of 2020. Uh, this is the report here of our uh, center uh, in uh, Sorbonne uh, University Hospitals in uh, the uh, east of Paris, and uh, comparing uh, the characteristics of the patients uh, in the uh, EOLIA study and those treated, it was 83 patients treated uh, uh, at that time, uh, between March and June 2020, uh, the main difference was mainly that we pruned much, many more patients before ECMO than we did before, uh, was close to 100% uh, for those COVID-19, and they tended to be sicker. Uh, the PF ratio was 62, was 73 in EOLIA, and the compliance was also uh, a little bit lower uh, in uh, those COVID-19 patients. And we did, well, uh, the uh, uh, overall um, probability of death was 31% uh, at day 60, 35 at day 90. It was very close uh, to what was observed in the uh, EOLIA uh, trial. Uh, however, there were differences, and mainly uh, the duration of VV ECMO support was much longer. It was only 11 days median in EOLIA. In COVID patients, was uh, three weeks uh, median and it also tended to be longer uh, over the months. And of course, the duration in the ICU was longer, uh, and since the duration of mechanical ventilation was also longer, uh, there were more patients developing VAPs uh, during uh, COVID-19. A couple of weeks later, we published, uh, this time, the uh, uh, experience of the Greater Paris. Uh, we uh, gathered a group, uh, once again, in mid-March 2020, to organize the activity with some centers uh, capable of uh, 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 cannulating patients and treating patients on VV ECMO. Uh, some centers uh, did, we did not have the possibility, and also there were five mobile ECMO retrieval teams which are active uh, during these uh, first weeks of the pandemic. Uh, so this is a, a, a Nubet's book model with ECMO centers and the mobile uh, rescue teams. And uh, uh, during that time, we got close to 600 calls of these, uh, 302 were approved, and most of these patients, two thirds of these patients were actually retrieved uh, by a mobile team. Uh, the survival rate was not uh, as good as uh, in uh, our uh, experience centers. Here uh, we had uh, uh, a survival rate which was 46% uh, uh, at day 90. And when looking at uh, this, uh, the characteristics seated with the survival, clearly age was a strong predictor here. Uh, look here, uh, it's from 48 only to 57. It's frightening. And the mortality for those patients over 57 was uh, uh, over 60%. Uh, also, the number of days uh, of intubation before ECMO, this is something which was known for years, uh, was seated with mortality. And if you believe that ECMO will salvage your patients, you should do it within, let's say, two, three days. Waiting longer here was clearly associated with worse outcome. Another very important point, and we'll discuss that also uh, at the end of that talk, is the caseload, the volume of ECMO. Uh, this is the volume of VV ECMO in 2019, and we uh, split uh, 
uh, the uh, uh, experience here between patients treated in experience centers, do, we did more than 30 cases of VV uh, the year before COVID, and those we did not. And you see here a strong uh, difference also in terms of mortality. The good news is there was no difference between those patients retrieved by the mobile team and those who, uh, who did not. So it's a strong incentive here uh, to promote this hub and spoke uh, activity. So uh, in the following months, uh, we gathered a lot of data, probably more patients treated uh, with VV ECMO in these two years than in the last two decades. And uh, the largest uh, uh, papers and database published were obviously the ELSO uh, database here. This first paper came in September 2020, uh, more than 1,000 patients here. Uh, the characteristics are uh, very close to uh, the characteristics uh, uh, published in other uh, series of patients. Uh, <clears throat> the mean PF was 72, maybe a little bit higher uh, than, uh, than in our uh, series of patients, and the rate of prune positioning was 60%, just the EOLIA rate, but it was not, uh, as uh, in Europe, uh, close to 100% of patients prune uh, before uh, uh, ECMO was mostly respiratory ECMO. Very few patients uh, got uh, uh, VA ECMO indication. Some myocarditis was very rare, uh, actually. And uh, this is the main result of that uh, ELSO first paper. Uh, the uh, probability of uh, surviving at hospital discharge was 37. Once again, very close to EOLIA. Well, you should know that it was uh, only uh, uh, probability of hospital discharge. They did not get the actual uh, survival rate. So. There are some patients discharged to long-term acute care facilities, uh, to other hospitals. The actual mortality may have been 5 to 10 percent higher uh, than this uh, 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 rate here of 37. And this is the second one here, uh, one year later, uh, taking into account the second and third surge. Uh, this is a massive series here, more than 4,000 patients included. Uh, basically, same results in terms of uh, predictors of mortality, age, uh, cardiac arrest, pre-ECMO, uh, the numbers, uh, the hours of intubation before ECMO as well, uh, and uh, those patients who got VA had a poor prognosis. And this is the main result for me of that uh, second paper. Uh, first, uh, in blue, it's the mortality uh, of their first uh, paper, uh, those patients treated in experience centers during the first surge. In red, it's the second phase, uh, let's say the second half of 2020, beginning of 21, there was an increase in mortality and it was uh, mostly reported by uh, uh, other groups and series worldwide, probably because there was less uh, uh, strict criteria uh, for uh, ECMO at that time. And in green here, it's the patients treated in centers who had less experience, do centers with treated patients only uh, during uh, the uh, second phase. It was a mortality. Once again, it's not the actual mortality, the predicted mortality at the discharge, which was close to 50% uh, in that series of patients. Luigi, it's your uh, group, uh, and you did well, very well. Probably the best results uh, uh, worldwide here. It's a series of 243 patients uh, treated in the UK. The UK has organized the activity uh, in a very strict way. Uh, there is only five, at five centers at that time in the UK uh, providing VV ECMO and very strict criteria to go for ECMO. Uh, the PF was maybe a bit higher than uh, at least in our series of patients. The mortality was only 25, uh, the actual mortality here. But look, SOFA score was five. Uh, it was 11, 12 uh, in most of other series uh, published uh, uh, worldwide. So, Clearly here, those patients are mostly um, uh, isolated respiratory failure uh, because they had four uh, for the SOFA, just one point uh, over four uh, for the resp uh, respiratory SOFA score. But very good results here. And they were able also to do a case control analysis showing that the absolute mortality regression was close to 20, uh, which is huge, which is uh, really uh, huge uh, here. Uh, the uh, alternative is Germany. Uh, in Germany, there's no regulation. Uh, of the activity. There's many, many centers uh, doing ECMO and an actually incentive for centers uh, to perform ECMO because of uh, uh, more money they may get. Uh, this is the massive series here, uh, more than 3,000 patients treated in Germany in uh, the three phases of the disease and the mortality was 68. Very high mortality here. The age was, uh, 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 the patients were older, 10 to 15 years older, 
And once again, there was no uh, regulation, so many, many centers treated less than uh, uh, five patients uh, during uh, that time. Uh, so the, there's not much granularity for that series of patients, but uh, it's, it's interesting to have these data. So, well, did we actually save patients with this technology? And we have some studies which are obviously retrospective, which, but which all tend to uh, show a benefit. I love this paper which was published in the blue. It's a small letter uh, from Nashville, but it's very interesting because they were able to compare uh, the outcome of patients when there was a capacity for ECMO in blue and was no capacity. The, the centers were overwhelmed. There was no possibility of providing ECMO. And, uh, well, mortality was 90% uh, when there was no ECMO available and was only 43 for the same patients, same characteristics of the patients. Indirect proof for sure. Uh, but for me, very convincing. And then we did the massive uh, case control retrospective analysis. This is the uh, COVID-19 critical care consortium here, uh, with, uh, which was a large database uh, in which uh, more than 800 uh, patients received ECMO and uh, many others did not. So they were able to do case control analysis with sophisticated stats, and they were able to show that there was a benefit, and uh, uh, the benefit in terms of mortality was around 7% decrease in 60-day uh, 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 mortality uh, when looking at those patients with a PF below 80, so the uh, EOLIA entry. It was true for most uh, 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 subgroups of patients here uh, regarding age, comorbidities. Uh, this is another one here uh, from the U.S., uh, the Stop COVID investigators. Uh, well, they published a series for which the mortality was uh, around 35 as well. But it's very interesting because they have also a massive uh, series of patients uh, of whom most of uh, them did not receive ECMO. So they were able to do a case control uh, analysis using uh, the latest uh, statistical method, which is called a target trial, a target trial emulation of ECMO. And uh, uh, using this methodology, which is close to an RCT, it will never be an RCT, but it was close. And they were showing that the uh, difference in mortality was 12%, uh, 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 very close to uh, what was observed in EOLIA, 35 uh, versus uh, 47. We also did that in uh, uh, Europe, in France, uh, Switzerland, and uh, Belgium uh, with the COVID ICU database, uh, also more than 4,000 patients here, uh, and there were more, to, more than 200 patients who did receive ECMO during the first uh, weeks of the pandemic. And we also did uh, this uh, emulated target trial analysis of ECMO, and overall there was no benefit. And we had to break down uh, the uh, uh, series by those patients who did receive ECMO only in experiment centers, but those, those who did not. And as you can see here, uh, the benefit was only for those patients treated uh, in uh, highly uh, experienced centers. More recent data, uh, it's the latest uh, series we uh, gathered here only from highly experienced centers in Europe. Uh, there was more than uh, 20 centers here, <coughs> and we gathered uh, 1,800 uh, cases of VV ECMO. And here, the interest is that we evaluated the uh, evolution of those patients during uh, the different search, wild type, alpha, delta. There was no difference overall uh, without adjustment uh, between those three types of strains of COVID, uh, which also showed that there was a small increase in mortality during the second semester of 2020, but in uh, uh, 21, uh, the mortality went back to around 40%. Uh, age was a strong pred predictor. The duration of uh, uh, Non-divasive mechanical ventilation, high flow here, was also clearly associated with mortality. And after adjusting, delta patient had a higher mortality. So in conclusion, yes, ECMO does not kill people. But once again, 10 years ago, uh, when uh, uh, we did the EOLIA trial, uh, there was uh, uh, clearly a concern. And actually, ECMO rescued a lot of uh, COVID-19 patients. It's always possible to say no to ECMO if the patient is too sick, too old, has been too long uh, on the vent. It's maybe also possible to say, well, not yet. Did you prune the patient? Did you adjust the vent? And clearly now we need to build networks. We need to organize the activity. We need to know if prone positioning under ECMO uh, improve the outcome of those patients. So There's a lot of research to be conducted. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for this fantastic overview. Um, any questions?
Well, maybe I can start with one. I was just thinking you presented your um, criteria that you had just published before the COVID-19 started and then you um, adopted it. Did you change it over time? I mean, how did you flex uh, based on capacity, based also on the um, ELSA recommendation to look at two factors? How did you evolve that? Um, so first, regarding capacity, uh, we did not face shortage of ICU beds in the Greater Paris. Uh, it was close. Uh, in mid-April, was close. Uh, one night with only one bed remaining uh, for the world uh, region. Uh, so there was no limitation for that matter. Uh, but over the months, we saw that clearly age was a major factor to do with mortality. So we tended to decrease uh, the upper age limit and uh, at the end was clearly 60. And beyond that uh, threshold, well, uh, the patient had to be really fit, uh, did a marathon the way before, uh, to be a, a candidate for a VV ECMO. Uh, and same for the duration of mechanical That's for Marco, just... <laughs> <laughs> it's actually running. You would have uh, got ECMO, Marco, for sure. <laughs> uh, Alain, you, you... I mean, it has been really consistent since many years now that uh, expert centers have better results. And um, going back to uh, Antoine's presentation, we know that um, VV ECMO improves right ventricular function by decreasing hypoxic vasoconstriction, which makes more shunt in the, in the lung. And that's why you need very high blood flow and, and large cannula. Has this been compared, the, 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 the blood flow used and the size of the cannula between ex expert centers and non-expert centers? Uh, I think it was done during the H1N1 pandemic. I do not have data uh, as far as I remember for the COVID-19. Uh, but uh, beyond uh, the technical aspects of ECMO, it might be also the, 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 the vent setting uh, under ECMO, which may make a difference here. Right, but if you, if you have a, an efficient ECMO, you don't need the vent, right? So that's... Uh... <laughs> yeah, but in, uh, for example, in the uh, uh, H1N1 series we published in yeah, yeah, yeah. France, there was no, a agree. major impact of uh, the vent setting uh, under ECMO. So uh, this is something we may investigate. Yeah. But clearly here, the, the data for Ger from Germany, for example, they indicate that beyond the experience of the group, the entry criteria for ECMO uh, might also have been different between, yeah, between serious patients. And what you observed uh, in the UK, if you select your patients very tightly, uh, you may get very good results. And this is very similar to the Australian, to you know, Carol uh, Hodgson uh, results in Australia, very similar to the UK, very similar criteria. And your mortality was very similar, wasn't it, yeah, mm. uh, compared to the UK? So you may get down to close to 20. Yeah. 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 Mm. Very good. Any other thoughts or questions? Otherwise, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So, um, Dan Brody again, if I'm correct. Uh, yes. My pleasure to welcome Dan to talk about um, an interesting evolution in the use of ECMO during COVID-19. Uh, thank you once again, Laurent. Um, and, I, you know, one of the things that you'll see in sessions like this is a little bit of overlap that I think is uh, very important because you begin to see from different perspectives some of the similar studies that will be presented. Either that or we're going to repeat ourselves. Um, so these are my uh, disclosures. They haven't changed since this morning. Um, so the way we think about the role of ECMO has evolved during COVID-19. And so I want to look at several aspects of that because I do think that, you know, all of medicine evolved, certainly ICU medicine. And uh, ECMO, when we first started, there was this sense that oh, they, they don't survive because that was the information we got from Wuhan, but it was very selected information uh, under very extreme circumstances there. Uh, and uh, I think that as we've uh, learned more, we've gone from being very uh, optimistic to maybe a little bit more skeptical. So early in the pandemic, what was the role of ECMO for COVID-19 related to ARDS? You know, we, we published this uh, early on with the notion that there were all kinds of things being said. We should do it, we shouldn't do it, uh, why we should do it and whom we should do it. Uh, and you know, we should change our practices because COVID is different. And we wanted to get across that until we have some evidence to suggest that there is a heterogeneity of treatment effect, that if we do something in these patients, 
uh, that will have a different result than we, if we do them in other patients, then until we have that data, we should continue to treat the patients uh, as we would using the same uh, algorithm that uh, we had used all along, which uh, uh, should reflect something like this algorithm that we published in Lancet Respiratory Medicine back in 2019. So the question was, was there data to support the approach of uh, going ahead with our prior algorithm? Uh, and uh, this is the uh, first of the two uh, studies that we published in The Lancet uh, from the ELSO registry data. And this is from a COVID-19 addendum that was created very rapidly. The ELSO registry committee did tremendous work under uh, great pressure early in the pandemic. Uh, and this is really with great credit to my colleagues, Brian Barbaro, Graham McLaren, and Phil Boonstra that we were able to get this out so quickly. Uh, and this was, of course, with uh, Alain Combe, uh, Roberto LaRusso, and many others. So uh, this is 1,035 patients. So early on in the pandemic, this was by far the largest experience, 213 centers, 36 countries. And we were able to show that the estimated, because not everybody actually had a final outcome at the time of reporting, the estimated cumulative incidence of mortality 90 days after the initiation of ECMO was 37.4%. And if you compare that to the intervention arm of Eolia, seems essentially the same. So it did give us the suggestion that these patients, when treated in a similar fashion, um, at least in observational data, would have similar outcomes. But as Alain showed you, there, was, uh, there were outliers from the early experience. We had looked at this countrywide data in Germany because it was an unselected population. Unlike the ELSA registry, where it's a voluntary registry, you give your data or you don't, there are many centers not participating. Here we have the data from Germany. This is all of it um, because it's all submitted to the, uh, to the uh, national database. Uh, and so looking at these uh, 3,397 COVID-19 patients, as he said, there's this sense that it was across many ICUs. So 1,600 ICUs in Germany and 213 of them were considered ECMO ICUs. I mean, it's kind of extraordinary. Um, the mean age was 57, so it was older than we were seeing in other studies, uh, and that could account for it. But even when we accounted for age, that did not account uh, for the differences in mortality. And the mortality of 68% was a cautionary note, that it's not simply that we can apply the same things. I mean, ECMO in Germany is often practiced at the very highest levels, and yet uh, this uh, overall mortality might have better reflected real-world experience uh, from this unselected population. Uh, we, uh, among the many studies that were done at that time, uh, we wanted to put it all together in this systematic review of, uh, and meta-analysis from uh, Kolingod Ramanathan, uh, where we looked at uh, the first 22 observational studies, 1,900 patients at that time, heavily weighted to the, towards the 1,000 patients that were in the first ELSO study. Uh, this is really looking at VV, and again, we saw that, that same mortality. It was very reassuring early on that we were on track to have a similar population. Uh, but that turned out not to be the final answer. So outcomes have definitely been evolving since the early waves, and th this is the major thing that we needed to uh, really take uh, notice of. So once we made that observation, we looked back at the ELSO data, and here now we had 4,800 patients, 349 centers, 41 countries. Again, not unselected, but quite uh, representative. These are the three groups that Alain mentioned, those who were uh, treated in the initial uh, uh, study, which is to say up through May 1st of the first wave. Uh, at the same centers, after that, so comparing their early data with later data, and then study centers that had only started doing ECMO for COVID later on, what we called late adopters. They might have done ECMO for a long time, but just not for COVID. And again, the mortality of 37% uh, rose over time at the same centers to 59%, and at cent uh, 52%, and at centers who had just adopted uh, ECMO later on, it was even higher at 59%. Uh, we did another systematic review and meta-analysis, this time uh, uh, looking at 52 studies across 18,000 patients. Ryan uh, Ling uh, led us in this uh, particular systematic review. Most of the data is still coming out of uh, Europe and North America. And here, the pooled mortality was higher. It was 48.8% as compared to the earlier meta-analysis at 37%. And when we looked at the different periods of time, it went from 41.2% in the first half of 2020 to 46.4% and ultimately to 62% as we uh, got along into the first half of 2021. Um, so there has been an interesting evolution in outcomes over time. And I don't think this is a story that we know the answer to yet, although perhaps uh, we are, maybe I don't want to jinx us, but uh, perhaps we're past the point of having to look at large cohorts of COVID patients uh, who have received ECMO. Um, but uh, we do need to continue to keep an eye on this evolution. So what is the role of ECMO and COVID-19 related ARDS? 
Um, outcomes may uh, still be evolving, so the role has to evolve as we see what the outcomes uh, are. I wanted to pay particular attention to the use of prone positioning because that has evolved during COVID-19. And I think it's maybe one of the, uh, for, for those of, uh, of us in the room, and that's most of us who practice with uh, patients with respiratory failure, maybe one of the biggest stories. Uh, this is a very nice uh, survey out of Massachusetts in the United States, uh, looking at the uh, uh, change in use of prone positioning in hospitals across the state. Uh, with an 84% uh, response rate, they were able to show that hospitals who routinely perform prone positioning increased from 44% to 81%. And even 44, to be honest, is quite generous when we look at the data of who is actually being prone, um, who would qualify for it. But uh, you can see a doubling almost in the rate of prone positioning use. Uh, and that covered most uh, patients uh, throughout the state. So um, what, what could the impact of that be? Uh, the increased use of prone positioning prior to ECMO is uh, what I'm referring to in this case. Um, it might decrease the need for ECMO. And I always said this, I said that if we all would use prone positioning, I was mostly talking to people in uh, the United States, um, we would put ourselves out of business. We wouldn't need VV ECMO. And of course, that's an exaggeration, but not entirely. And so I do think that it would be good news if we had a decrease in the use of ECMO because the world has become better at treating patients uh, with severe respiratory failure, including, among other things, the use of prone positioning. But of course, it extends across all of that. Um, the way we study ECMO has evolved during, uh, during COVID-19, and there's been a lot of innovation in study design. And uh, Alain showed you uh, a couple of these uh, emulation trials. But it, again, this, many of the things that, uh, that we are, have now started to use in both critical care and specifically in the field of ECMO were not created by the people who are using them. Many have been around for Bayesian analysis. It's been around for over a century. But these are applied now to these populations, and we recognize the power of doing so. And emulated target trials, while not a randomized controlled trial per se, still have a great power to begin to look at observational data in a way that can be more helpful to glean some sense of a causal uh, relationship. So uh, what it can do is estimate the treatment effectiveness across populations in an uncontrolled setting, what actually happens in real life in observational data. It can emulate a pragmatic randomized controlled trial. Um, and it's complementary in a sense because especially when we can't simply perform a randomized trial in all patients like we couldn't in the first wave of COVID, um, it, it, it uh, gives us uh, at least more uh, data that we, we again, can uh, make more causal inference about. And it's possibly more generalizable to real world information. Um, and so uh, he showed you uh, this patient, uh, this population from the Stop COVID investigators. Um, so I won't go into the details there, except to say that uh, once again, the mortality actually uh, seemed to reflect that of Eolia. Uh, and the uh, paper uh, led by Martin Erner and Eddie Fan in uh, the British Medical Journal, which if you haven't seen, I really suggest uh, because it's quite sophisticated in the statistical analysis and was a very helpful uh, uh, study. It did show a, a reduction in mortality overall of 7.1% with the use of ECMO. Um, there, uh, another trial uh, is uh, Mathieu Schmidt uh, with uh, Alain uh, and uh, David Hajaj, uh, also looking at the French data, which again, a terrific way uh, to uh, look at this data. Here showing no difference in 90-day survival overall, but a difference uh, in survival at high volume centers, which again is a very important signal or in regions that had an ECMO network organization. So expanding our research repertoire in ECMO to look at potential trial designs like matched pair analyses, which we have had a lot of registry embedded randomized controlled trials, cluster randomized controlled trials, emulation trials. These are all tools to help us get uh, at better answers with the data that we have. And then trial infrastructure, adaptive trial designs, weighted lottery systems, and of course, what's become very popular uh, during uh, COVID uh, is the notion that platform trials can give us uh, a great uh, advantage in uh, studying large populations. Um, we also need uh, to begin looking at different outcomes, longer term outcomes, functional outcomes, quality of life, resource utilization and cost. These are all incredibly important. It's not simply enough in this day and age to say, yes, we saved the patient's life. The other thing that I, I think is a, a really important piece of the uh, puzzle during this time is the way we think about regionalization of ECMO. Um, and that, I think, has evolved during COVID-19. Um, so, uh, can we uh, uh, say that ECMO is contributing to survival? And when we look at these referred patients versus non-referred, and um, I love the paper that uh, Lam mentioned from uh, Vanderbilt in the United States, Whitney Gannon did great work on that. Um, here is uh, uh, work from Luigi's group 
uh, which I think is uh, incredibly instructive. Uh, and so this is a, a wonderful paper if you haven't seen it in intensive care medicine. Uh, and it's the contribution of ECMO at a specialist ECMO center to in-hospital survival. And so they looked retrospectively at referrals uh, for ECMO uh, for COVID-19 um, uh, from 111 referring hospitals in the United Kingdom to two of the hospitals that receive ECMO. Uh, that's Guys in St. Thomas's and the Royal Brompton. Uh, this is uh, early on in the, uh, in the first uh, year or so of the pandemic. They had 1,580 referrals, 217 were excluded, so they looked at 1,363 that were included in the analysis. 243 of those were actually transferred with mobile ECMO to a specialist center. 1,120 stayed where they were and did not receive ECMO. They used three matching techniques and looked for the best one um, for the marginal, marginal odds ratio for ho in hospital mortality uh, with ECMO. Uh, gen match turned out to be the best. There were 209 matches. Uh, and uh, the marginal odds ratio for mortality with ECMO was 0.44. I mean, that's rather extraordinary with an absolute reduction, uh, risk reduction of mortality of 18.2%. Um, so, I mean, there are a lot of caveats to this data, of course, but it's certainly a very strong signal and I think something we need to take very uh, seriously. And very importantly, they look, did a sensitivity analysis looking at those patients who were and were not transferred for ECMO, but who met criteria uh, you know, uh, for ECMO, um, and then matched those patients and saw the same signal. So the marginal odds ratio of 0.52 with an absolute risk reduction of 14.5%. So again, a very strong signal that if you had received ECMO, you met criteria and you received ECMO, um, that uh, you would have a much better outcome. So if you meet criteria in the UK uh, for ECMO for COVID-19, you have better survival if you receive it. And, and this is the major caveat, you receive your care at a specialized ECMO center. So it may not just be ECMO per se, it may be ECMO provided at uh, a very high level center. Um, so that's the residual confounding. Is it the ECMO or is it the non-ECMO care at a quaternary referral center? And they look into that. And I think the, it's pretty clear that the attributable uh, improvement of mortality is uh, at least partially due uh, to ECMO. So referral to an ECMO center confers survival advantage. We, we know, have known this in uh, many forms, particularly since uh, the CSER trial, but I think this was a great demonstration during COVID of why these uh, networks of hospitals with regionalization of ECMO can be very powerful. It doesn't mean we shouldn't do ECMO at smaller hospitals, particularly in remote locations, but it just means that we may have better outcomes if we can uh, gather ourselves to do it this way in an organized fashion. The techniques we use for ECMO have evolved during COVID-19. This is another interesting evolution. Just one example that uh, many of you who uh, follow the ECMO literature may be familiar with. This is a group um, from the United States in Chicago from Rush University who published early on in the pandemic a letter in JAMA Surgery. And they looked at their first 40 patients uh, with COVID-19 related ARDS. They all met EOLIA criteria. And there's a lot made of the fact that they use the Protec Duo uh, cannula, a right atrium to pulmonary artery uh, a double lumen cannula functions as a right ventricular assist device, but you can add an oxygenator and then it's ECMO. Um, but they actually offered a package of interventions that included direct thrombin inhibitors, glucocorticoids uh, prior to any of the trials at very high doses, uh, inhaled nitric oxide, a goal to extubate and ambulate the patients. Um, and all of that was a package. So it's very hard to tease out what portion of that package of interventions actually made the difference uh, in terms of their at least uh, very uh, high observational survival. They reported 15% uh, mortality initially, uh, but then in a follow-up letter went 17.5%. Again, um, half of what was being reported elsewhere. So a lot has been made of this, but since that time, only uh, a little bit more data uh, testing these hypotheses has trickled out. I think we, this is definitely something that we need to pay more attention to. Um, so uh, there is definitely, if you consider all of this together, been an interesting evolution in the use of ECMO during COVID-19. And I have no doubt that as we move, it is still evolving, um, or at least our understanding of how these trends might now apply outside of COVID-19 is still evolving. And this has given us, I think, the tools to begin to explore it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dan. We have um, time for a few questions and maybe comments from others. Uh, maybe I'll start with uh, asking you what, what you think are the main explanations for the increase in mortality across the different ways for ECMO patients. Is it the management pre-ECMO and the selection of patients? Is it uh, the virus itself? What's so? You, you say it has changed, so 
we expect to have a response to that. <laughs> <laughs> so the answer is yes. It has changed. Okay, thank you. And it is all of those things. Uh, potentially, no, it, we, we don't know. We don't know. And uh, if we look at the second ELSO registry paper, uh, one of the things that's interesting, this is in a very crude form, we, we looked at severity of illness. We didn't have great measures of it. But if you look at severity of illness, you had higher mortality later with lower severity of illness. So it suggests that it's not simply selection, although I have my doubts that we can put too much faith in that. I do think that there is, um, you know, you would, you would assume actually that as we got more confident with ECMO, we might start putting sicker and sicker patients on so we have worse outcomes. But that wasn't the signal that we saw. Again, I take that with a grain of salt because um, there probably is some element of that. And I think some of the data that we saw for, uh, from other parts of the world suggest that. Is the, the, there an impact from the different, uh, uh, you know, way, the different um, variants of the virus? Probably. But uh, it's very hard to get at. We have a paper that uh, is being worked on now looking very carefully at, uh, at the different variants to see if we can really isolate them in time uh, within a specific geographic location uh, so that we can start to tease that out. And there are other efforts, as you've seen, uh, to begin to do that. But it's very hard. There's overlap of the variants mm. within a geographic location over time. Uh, and it's not always clear, unless you're sequencing everybody, exactly what you're dealing with. So, um, I do think there probably is an impact of that. And then I think there are other factors that are secular related to changes in the way we treated the patients over time that may be impacting that. And you mentioned the good news that uh, prone positioning has, has been used much more. Uh, do, you, do we know if it continues or it, it went down again after the end of COVID? I have not seen anything recently. Uh, is a very good hypothesis uh, that should be tested is whether or not uh, the resources that were put into that and the training that was put into that was sustained over time. I do think that, again, that's probably one of the great legacies uh, for our field uh, is, you know, a, there, a, the management of ARDS overall, obviously everybody in the world is now an expert at managing ARDS, uh, including my social workers. Um, but uh, there, there are things that we learned as a community, and there are things that should be sustained. And you know, if not that, then I think we've made a big mistake. So it would be very important to look at those numbers, and if we're seeing a decrement as a community, to begin to invest uh, in continuing to uh, provide the highest level care across the boards so that we need ECMO as infrequently as possible. Dana, it's very interesting what, what you say, and obviously, um, I think we in the UK, and I'm sure different parts of the world have seen quite turnover of uh, staff uh, post-COVID-19. Yes. Uh, about 30% of our nurses have uh, decided to do something else. Uh, um, and so that learning that we've gained over the last three years in terms of teams, prompt positioning, um, might be lost. Uh, so there is something to be learned about how we can maintain those skills and um, train uh, new staff with a rapid turnover to do the same things that we did over the last three years. And maybe there's some education, maybe Carol will, might say something in the future, but I wonder what your thoughts were about this specific aspect of maintaining that skill. Yeah, no, I, I'll take that more as a comment than a question because I agree with you. I think it's an outstanding point. Um, I, I don't think there's any part of the world that's not affected by that trend. Um, I do think we've seen in our own ICUs that, uh, you know, for sure, we've lost a lot of wisdom, went out the door, uh, not just with our nurses, though, though, I think primarily with our nurses, but with many specialists uh, who we've relied on for many years. And so I, I do think that that is going to have an impact far more than just on prone positioning uh, and should be studied as we go forward. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dan, for... Um as you said, an interesting uh, talk about the use of ECMO during COVID-19. And we continue probably uh, along the same line. And my co-chair, Luigi Camporota, is going to discuss how ECMO changed outcome during COVID-19. OK, so good morning, everyone. And um, it's a pleasure to be here with you in person and meet so many people. Uh, that um, is a pleasure we've not had over the last three years. And as Dan said, there will be a sort of certain degree of overlap because the studies that we all see and comment are very similar. But I hope that we can see them uh, through different lenses and from different angles. Uh, so I've got no conflict of interest for this talk. But I, so the title is How ECMO Changed COVID-19 Outcome. 
But also at the end, the second part of my talk, I would like to change some of the words around and see how COVID-19 has changed ECMO. Uh, because I think there are a few things that, uh, that we've learned. So where did we start? We start with, with the idea that uh, COVID-19 was a new disease. We're not clear, as Dan also said, whether we needed different treatments. Uh, the prognosis was unclear. But that was in the context, not only in a new disease, but within a pandemic. So a large number of patients, there was capacity strain, organizational issues, resources, issue about triage, understanding what was the best patient. But also the time of illusion that, that uh, Dan illustrated very, very well just, uh, just now. And as you can see from the, uh, from the um, ELSO guidelines in 2021, uh, there were two things, obviously. One was the interaction between the patient se selection, so who were the candidate for ECMO, but also the, uh, in the relationship with an ECMO capacity. And you can see um, uh, that, oops, sorry. Uh, you, can see that, um, you can see that there is a relationship as the candidacy um, was established, uh, as the ECMO capacity changed for each individual center, obviously the, uh, the, 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 uh, the candidacy aspect was reviewed. So there was an interrelationship between, uh, between capacity and, uh, and patient selection. And so I've done it very sort of uh, rapidly. I know Dan couldn't say precisely, but I sort of uh, try to say what I, I think might be happening. So there is, uh, at the beginning, early, the survival was low. Obviously, the ECM was done at hoc. Uh, there were established centers already. There were no therapies for COVID-19. And there were uh, small case studies, which basically showed a very low mortality. And as more research restrictive indication started, maybe more organized, there were more protocols, I'll show later on, and more therapy available, survival increased, and now we have seen essentially other things have happened, perhaps a larger use of non-invasive ventilation, perhaps a later use of ECMO, so waiting a little bit longer, uh, and maybe selecting patients who, despite the fact that from a um, um, severity perspective, they don't look very different. They are selecting a non-responders to other treatments. These are just some ideas. So I think it's quite difficult to understand the effect of ECMO on COVID-19 because we don't have randomized controlled trials. What we have are retrospective studies, we have propensity matched case series, we've got natural experiments, and we've got emulated trials. Uh, so if we start with the retrospective studies, uh, obviously this uh, meta-analysis Dan has performed uh, has been discussed already, but I just want to say that uh, of all the studies here about about 1,800 patients, mortality, so uh, the mortality was 37%, which is interestingly very close, uh, obviously here, 90 days mortality, 36% in the ELSO cohort, uh, and you can see that 94% of these patients had been prone prior to ECMO, indicating that we were uh, really strict, making sure all conventional therapies were tried before ECMO was uh, was used. And if you can see that 36%, that's very close to that survival of, sorry, uh, that survival of 36% here in this um, patient uh, level meta-analysis combining the EOLIA trial and the CESA trial. You can see 90-day mortality was 36% in the ECMO group and 48% in the non-ECMO group. But you can see here there was a transition at uh, later stage, you can see this was uh, 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 before July survival about, sorry, mortality of 36% and after July mortality, sort of, uh, um, uh, mortality of 48%. So you can see that trend in mortality that Dan has described and Alan has described bef before. And again, some of the things that were hypothesized was again this prolonged use of non-invasive ventilation and some of the patients that might have been refractory to the therapies that uh, uh, were used for COVID-19. 
And this is a study where now completely show a reversal. You can see here that uh, the, um, the ECMO for COVID-19 was associated with greater probability of death compared to ECMO used in, uh, uh, in influenza or either viral pneumonia. And this is our own data. Basically, we show that uh, in association with a, uh, a difference in survival, uh, these patients stayed on ECMO much longer. And this is what, uh, uh, in agreement with what Alan just presented earlier on. So we've done a review of all historical 10-year uh, history of patients with viral pneumonia, mainly influenza. And you can see that the duration of ECMO was 11 days, very similar to your uh, data, uh, whereas in COVID-19 was 21 days. But what is interesting, this was not just the non-survivor, this was true also for survivors and non-survivors. So when we split um, the length of stay, non-survivors again, we can see the same thing, 11 versus 25. And then again, for the survivors, 10 versus 19. So this is not just a selection of patients who then do not survive, but this is true uh, for both uh, cohorts and might imply the time that it takes for the lung to recover compared to other viral pneumonitis. But again, those were observational studies, and they've got all the limitations that we discussed about observational studies. So what about propensity matching? So we'll try and make them as close as possible uh, to a, uh, a randomized controlled trial, but not quite. Uh, um, and what we can see, this is done as presented already. This is our study, so I'm not going to spend much time, but just to see the marginal mortality benefit when you compare um, patients who were referred uh, um, and went on ECMO, the ones who didn't. And this is not me, I, um, something happened. <laughs> okay, I can talk. Um, okay, maybe some, uh, some uh, video would be nice. I just was going to, if you could see the slide. I can um, see, but uh, you can see the slide. The one. I can turn them around, but perhaps if we can reestablish some content might be better. Um, but anyway, I can, uh, in the meantime, I can describe, oh, that's great. Uh, I can describe it for you. But essentially, this is, an, oh, this is another um, uh, study, which basically was a propensity matched. I think we're still missing half of the slide, but any, anyway. But you can see there, comparing um, um, ECMO-eligible patients who did not go into ECMO uh, and um, the ones who did, and you can see here, extubation, 75% uh, uh, of patients who received ECMO were extubated, um, uh, whereas only 16% were extubated, and you can see the hospital discharge, the difference, and you can see here the couple of Meyer curves suggesting a uh, really a relative risk reduction, which is si quite significant. I don't know whether we can do something with, oh, yeah. fantastic, wonderful, thank you. And then we come to natural experiment, and I think um, Alana's already uh, shown this. This is what happened when you have a natural experiment. So you've got a situation where there is no capacity for ECMO, so the ECMO center is closed, and then here you can see the um, 55 patients where that was the um, uh, uh, mortality, 89% mortality, and this is when the capacity is um, there, so the ECMO center is open and can admit patients. Again, quite significant uh, um, mortality difference. Uh, but I think the most robust data that we've got are the emulated trial, and I'm really glad that uh, Dan explained what they are. So uh, I think um, we can go, we can essentially our observational studies uh, using observational data to simulate or emulate a real um, 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 study uh, to evaluate effectiveness. And you can see again here, when you emulate these studies, uh, you can see compared to conventional ventilation, patients who receive received ECMO with a PF ratio less than 80, I've got a better survival um, uh, uh, compared to the conventional one. And you can see here, particularly patients who had high driving pressure would benefit the most. And this is regardless of the age, Marco would be very pleased, and, and also obesity, so um, damn. Uh, 
Fantastic. So, and this is another emulated trial which essentially shows the same beneficial effect of ECMO, regardless of which sensitivity analysis we use. So, the other side is how ECMO changed, ec uh, how COVID-19 changed ECMO, the way we do ECMO. So, first of all, uh, there are a few things. We'll, we've done more ECMO teams, uh, protocol, selection criteria, and hub bespoke or centralized high volume centers. So, the ECMO team, so if you can see these studies, you can see that once we started uh, having dedicated ECMO team that triage patients, they can retrieve patients, particularly mobile ECMO, the survival is significantly better for patients treated on ECMO. So having dedicated team. This is the same thing, but I was before COVID-19. And again, uh, that, uh, that effect of mortality of having a dedicated ECMO team is still there. And it's quite important because this is a message that we see across different as other aspects. This is a shock team, the effect of shock team for cardiogenic shock. Again, they're associated with better survival. Um, selection criteria, I'm going to say very little. But essentially here you can see in um, uh, the number of uh, protocol present, so units who had protocol available for ECMO is very small, low percentage pre-COVID-19 and increased quite substantially during and after COVID-19, both in low volume ECMO centers, but also in high volume ECMO centers. So that's quite important. And then we discussed about uh, hub and spoke or centralized high volume centers. And this is quite important because if you look on the right hand side, this was a ELSO study that was in the mechanical ventilation and the same, the same um, uh, relationship between volume outcome was already present in mechanical ventilation and it's the same thing. This is the study from uh, Alain's group and it's already presented but you can see among all the different um, 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 parameters or variables that might explain a difference in survival Clearly, the volume of um, the, the, the volume is of ECMO center is very important. So you can see that having a, um, been admitted uh, to a center does more than 30 ECMO per year in the previous year uh, was associated with almost threefold increase in the in the chance of survival for that uh, particular patient. And this is seen also in other case series. You can see this is again from the from the ELSA registry, and you can see that there is a uh, relationship between uh, low case, higher mortality, higher cases, lower lower mortality. And this is again an emulated trial that's been presented before and you can see that the, the greatest factor that separates the survival between uh, a conventional and ECMO is whether a patient is admitted to a high volume center. So you can see high volume and, uh, and low volume center. So I'm going to conclude the uh, basically saying that uh, um, ECMO is effective in the management of refractory COVID-19 ARDS, and then the way we define refractory is also changed over time. Uh, COVID-19 had a, um, caused a longer duration of stay in ECMO, and this is both in survival and non-survival, survivors and non-survivors. And um, the mortality has changed and made it very complex for us to understand what uh, ECMO-related factors, what are patient-related factors, or organizational um, factors. And again, but also, I would say that COVID-19 has changed the way we approach ECMO. Again, teams, protocols, and regionalization. And clearly, it's quite important, this effect here, which is quite clear that ECMO is best performed in high-volume centers. And with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luigi. Um, we, we have time for discussion again. What's your, um, what would, would be your definition of, uh, well, no, I know it's, your definition is high volume center, right? But what, what's, what makes the difference? <laughs> 
Um, I think it's, what makes the difference is the organizational aspect. So essentially, if we start from the beginning, um, so that the idea that um, patients can be referred to one team, the team has got a multidisciplinary aspect that can be discussed. So the element of discussion is very important. We've seen also in the uh, shock, uh, shock teams for cardiogenic shock. So it's the same, the same thing. Then it's about uh, training. We touched upon the training. So having high volume referral, high training, high resources, this is associated with better protocols, better training, and therefore better outcomes. So there is that uh, uh, virtuous loop that goes from uh, the high volume to uh, more refined delivery of, of the ECMO. Um, and then it makes it also more cost effective, which in turn makes, makes it easier to, uh, to surge. I mean, one of, the, one of the problems that we had with uh, a volume outcome uh, in, in, during a pandemic that almost you have an inverse, we've seen an inverse relationship because that was a crisis surge, it wasn't a volume due to, uh, was stretching the natural capacity and clearly a ECMO centre has got better ability to stretch and accommodate larger volume of patients uh, with the same level of care, which is not the case as we've seen in, um, in uh, the level of strain that some of I see of experiencing in ventilated patients with COVID-19. Thanks. Uh, the, this issue of the cost effectiveness is, I, I think, is important also because we mentioned health inequalities, right? And it, mm. ECMO is for rich countries. But uh, making it uh, more affordable, uh, I think, is important. Is there any uh, assessment of, uh, for instance, you, you, you all cited Germany, right, as, a, a, as not an optimal model, where a lot of ECMO centers could be without regulation. So I, my guess is that it means probably a poor uh, cost uh, uh, benefit. Uh, so is there an evaluation between the UK where it's very organized, very centralized and only a limited center and, and Germany in terms of cost effectiveness? I mean, first of all, I would like to say that um, uh, there is no direct comparison as such. Um, obviously, the healthcare economics of the UK was evaluated in the CESAR trial because that was a combined health evaluation. Um, but I think we must say that it's not just Germany, otherwise, you know, the German people in the, uh, it's, it's a lot of countries that have got uh, uh, a different regulation, Italy being one and uh, France outside the great, uh, greater Paris and, and other countries. So I think, I think there is more and more data to suggest that we need to be uh, more uh, centralized. We need to use our uh, resources more wisely and in, in, a, in, a, in a small, you know, in a more constant trade a number of uh, um, centers and I think what it will mean for the lower income countries um, that is something that we'll need to evaluate how can we can make it more affordable and certainly more diffuse use of telemedicine might be something important for the, uh, the way we uh, big centers can advise supervise and train other countries so I think there is a lot a lot more to discuss and to learn from that yeah, my point was not in any way against Germany. Yeah. It was just because they published their That's data, right? right? Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Is, which is uh, nice. So, yes. So, how telemedicine would help to do ECMO? I think um, I think the the biggest step is obviously there is the training, there is a learning curve, there is a patient discussion. Uh, so that kind of um, experience can be in sort of way exported because there is obviously the the practical aspect of ECMO, which is the cannulation, the transport, uh, and that can be learned. But the experience uh, that takes a long time, and I think that can be export could be exported. But obviously, it's a model that we'll need to explore in the future, I think. Okay. If there are no questions, thank you so much, right. uh, Luigi. <laughs> and I, I, I think I will introduce, and that's my pleasure, the next uh, and last speaker of the session, uh, Carol Hudson from uh, Monash University in Melbourne, Australia, and who is going to... Okay. Challenge everything. Challenge everything.
Carrot. I think that was my fault, Laurel. Oh. <laughs> Hello everybody, it's uh, a pleasure to be here and I'm very happy not to be speaking about COVID-19 because I'm not sure how I would be able to add to the previous speakers, they've done such a wonderful job. Um, I wanted to speak to you about how we've thought about challenging the status quo with ECMO. And this is not just at a national or a bi-national level, and I'm from Australia, so this is how we've thought about it in Australia and New Zealand. But more importantly, it's how we've thought about it globally from the International ECMO Network. Uh, so on behalf of my colleagues in the International ECMO Network, I just want to have a uh, discussion about how we've thought about disrupting the status quo. So. We've all heard the problem. There's a huge number of ECMO patients and that's expanding. The devices and the technology are changing rapidly. ECMO is associated with increased length of stay, which is the main driver of increased costs of ECMO. There's a wide variation in practice. It's expensive to deliver because of the training and the number of staff required as well as, as, well as the length of stay. And the long-term outcomes of our survivors are rarely reported. And there's been a huge use of registry and large cohort data, particularly throughout the pandemic, which has really made us think very carefully about how we can harness this data and leverage it for clinical trials and for other types of uh, improvement. So how do we think about embedding clinical trials within registry data or large cohort data? And there's clearly um, significant overlap between how we can improve patient outcomes with uh, clinical registries, with prospective clinical reg research, and of course then just practice policy and stewardship. So I'm going to talk to you about four things, or really three main things, and I'll, I'll mention economic uh, evaluations and ec economic outcomes at the end if I have time. But I want to talk to you about patient-centred research and co-design, the use of registry data, and how we've embedded trials. So if I start with patient-centred research and co-design, of course there's a variety of ways that you can embed um, you know, your consumers and your community within the research or within your, even just within your quality projects. And at the bottom of that graph you can see you can just inform patients that they've been enrolled in, in research or that they're participating and collect their data. But at the top end, which is where I'm really interested in going, you can really partner with consumers and you can have consumer-led research. And I think that that can really enrich the way that you deliver outcomes for patients. So the way that we've done it is uh, several, there are several ways that we've done it. The first was just to do qualitative studies of our survivors to talk about what was important to them while they were receiving ECMO. And that's helped us to inform our research questions. They've given us input into our core outcome sets so that we're collecting the right outcomes that are important to survivors. And then they've helped us to plan the research projects around both the, the topics that are important to them and the outcome measures that they think are important. We also include our consumers on our funding applications. They're part of our management committees and they communicate with us at international meetings. And that's a picture of um, Shanna, one of our survivors. That's uh, on ECMO, her at the age of 17. And then that's her at the age of 30 presenting to us at the SMAC conference in front of 3,000 people. And when we interviewed our survivors, they came out with three really important themes. Um, and possibly even four, but there were threats of serious injury and death, hallucinations in the ICU, and then deconditioning, immobility, and dependency. And uh, we're, we've got programs of research in all of those, and in, in the fourth theme, which they mentioned, which was actually the, the uh, transitions of care from ICU and beyond. So within those, we've built themes of research to try and address our consumer concerns. And this is Craig Dicker, another one of our consumers, and the Dicker family are a wealthy philanthropic family in Australia, and they've actually funded our, our national ECMO registry. So not only are, is Craig on our management <coughs> committee and, and involved in our research priorities and our research setting, but they're also funding our research. So how do we use registry data? So um, when we met with the International ECMO Network about six years, seven years ago, maybe even longer now, um, Dan Brody, Eddie Fan, and I sat down and we, we thought that what we really wanted to do was 
to collect data, not overlapping with ELSO, but complementary to ELSO, so something that was a little bit more granular, something that could inform clinical trials and where we could embed clinical trials. And to that end, I set up an Australian-New Zealand registry within our countries. Eddie set up a Canadian, North American and European registry, which is collecting data. Um, and we have interest for other participants um, in Asia and in the UK um, more recently. So we've thought about this in terms of staff training complications and national and international capture, and I'll just talk you through those. So we did three things. We did qualitative interviews of the clinicians who are performing ECMO nationally in Australia. We also did an annual site survey to identify the number and type of ECMO patients admitted, who's using clinical practice guidelines, staff numbers involved in ECMO, and the way that they're trained and, and the way that they manage their data. And then we looked at registry patients where we actually enrolled our patients to see what was actually being done. So the themes that the clinicians came up with, which was fairly consistent, but it did differ between high and low volume centres, was staff training and feedback, equipment optimisation, interdisciplinary support, and mentoring between high and low volume sites. And to that end, we looked at the barriers and facilitators to being able to deliver good quality ECMO. And Staff training and feedback was probably the most important thing that they identified, although we have also set up mentoring systems. So in our site survey, we identified that staff activity was only monitored before we used the Excel registry in 48% of sites and complications were only reported at 57% of sites. And following the uh, implementation of the registry, we now have ECMO activity reported across 100% of sites and complications reported across 100% of sites. So that's 30 sites in Australia and New Zealand. In terms of staff ECMO activity, the staff had identified that what they were most worried about was causing harm. So we embedded identifiers within the registry so that each time a uh, patient was cannulated, it was an identifier per staff member. And that meant that in terms of safety training and accreditation, you could identify how many cannulations a staff member had done and whether that cannulation was associated with harm. So if there was an ongoing complication and it was thought that um, you know that was a consistent trend, then there would be extra uh, uh, training implemented with that staff member. Um, so we, uh, the holders of the registry, don't have the staff identifier, so it's not like we can identify the staff member, but that's held by the um, principal investigator at the site, the head of the research there. And for each site, we provide six monthly reports of their ECMO utilisation. And these reports look at not just survival, but they also look at um, standardised mortality ratio. And they report that for each of the sites. So there's a healthy competition between the sites in terms of improving their outcomes. And they can see if they're an outlier within the system um, for patients on VV ECMO, VA ECMO, or eCPR. And we, re we report each of those separately. And we also report complications and long-term outcomes. So for each of those sites that they can see how they're comparing and we compare it to all other sites in the registry. We've also been asked to compare between states. So for example, our largest states, the state of Victoria and the state of New South Wales have done head-to-head -head comparisons of, for example, COVID patient outcomes. We've also been asked to do head-to-head -head comparisons of two of our major centres in different states. Um, that one was particularly worried about bleeding complications, and we actually worked out the differences in coagulation practices so that we aligned the state that had more bleeding with the, the uh, centre that had less bleeding. And then we've been asked to do that across our states, um, per se, to report to government as well. So this is something that's been up, uh, taken up not just by the clinicians in the centres, but also at a, at a um, national level by government. In terms of registry linkage, we were really concerned that we didn't want to interrupt the um, data that was already being sent to ELSO. So we have completely embedded the ELSO database within our registry so that our sites only have to collect data once and we can um, upload it from the back end of our registry and send it straight to ELSO. So they don't have to submit data directly into ELSO. We have exactly mirrored the database in, um, in, in Toronto so that Eddie Fan's data can now embed our clinical trials and we can compare outcomes because our data definitions and our data points are exactly the same. And within Australia and New Zealand, we have a large ICU database, the core database, and we found a way to link with core so that we can compare outcomes within the core database. That means that we'll be able to compare ECMO to non-ECMO patients in the future. <coughs> 
And lastly, I really wanted to emphasise how important I think it is to have registry embedded trials and novel trial design. So we had a vision across Australia and New Zealand that we wanted every patient that was on ECMO to be involved in clinical trials, and I think that we're starting to achieve that. So we've done that by embedding um, our trials within our registries. So obviously there's some overlap. You, in a quality registry, you have observational studies. It's all comers on ECMO. It's hypothesis generating. It's pragmatic and it's low cost. And when you do a randomised controlled trial, it's a selected group. It's randomised. The, sele the selection obviously is much more narrow. It's much more expensive and you've got causal inference. But if you embed it, you've got a registry randomised controlled trial. To think about registry randomised controlled trials, there's a lot of things that you need to consider. Some of those include the, uh, the appropriately, appropriateness of the registry itself. We custom built ours so that it could embed our trials. You need to think about the data characteristics and make sure that you have the data definitions aligned. And again, because we've done our own data definitions, we've been able to do that. You need to consider the methodological differences, um, the eligibility criteria, the recruitment processes, the ethical considerations. It's actually really complex with ECMO patients now that we've got so many studies running to go to them with five or six different consent forms. And then you need to consider opportunities for outputs for future scientific use. So whether you can incorporate into formal guidelines or clinical or policy decision making. So this is what we've done. We've got all of our patients across Australia and New Zealand who have data collected under a waiver of consent so that we don't need any sort of um, consent from them to collect their data at a hospital level. And then they have opt-out um, consent for the six and 12 month outcomes, functional outcomes, which is done centrally from a call centre. So we've got now 1,500 patients who have been enrolled on our ECMO registry bi-nationally across Australia and New Zealand. And then within that, we've got funded a, um, we've got funded the PRECISE study, which is looking at biomarkers to try and look at um, patient selection and prognostication. We've got interventional trials funded, including trials of um, high oxygen versus low oxygen in VA ECMO. We're looking at um, different rehabilitation practices in all comers. Uh, we're looking at uh, the start of ECMO, whether we should start ECMO earlier or later. Uh, and we're also looking at our transfusion practices, and all of them have been funded at a national level. We've also got some observational studies ongoing, looking at nutritional practices, and then we've got some post-follow-up um, and economic evaluations. So within our registry, we've got the cost, so we're about to publish our first cost paper. We're also um, looking at the transitions of care, so whether we can link with GPs to feedback about ongoing complications and, and disabilities in patients who've survived. So in terms of registry embedded outcomes at six and 12 months, we've been able to look at these and, and this has re recently been published in the Lancet Respiratory Medicine, but we know that for all types of ECMO that there's functional disability in our survivors across all of the, um, all of the modes of function, so um, all of the outcomes of function. So this is using the World Health Organization's disability assessment schedule. Um, and you can see that for, for work, for, um, forming friendships for cognition, for all of the areas there was problems. But we also know that there's a huge variation in how there are problems. So there are some people who enter and, um, you know, they had disability to start with and they have disability at the end. There's some people who have disability to start with and it actually improves after they've had an ICU admission um, and received ECMO. And then there's other people who have increased disability. So in terms of novel trial design, I think that this has been mentioned before, so I don't need to cover it too much, except to say that we've just had our first platform trial um, funded by our national government. So that's very exciting, where we're going to be able to embed um, four types of uh, studies within the platform and, and to look at those all at the same time. Obviously, that's a complex design, and we've need a lot of support from statisticians to design it, but I think that definitely that's the way of the future. And with a vision of wanting to have everybody involved in research, that's probably the way to go. But there's also other designs like step wedge design that can be um, useful, particularly um, there was one study that we're looking at where we're trying to implement training practices. And we've got a task trainer and a um, train the trainer and mentor feedback. And uh, if we use that sort of design, we'll probably use a step wedge. So future clinical trials, we need to look at earlier versus later initiation of ECMO, different types of devices, different therapies during ECMO. So even though we don't, you know, I think that we've all agreed that, um, you know, 
VV ECMO is beneficial for patients who are selected carefully, but we do need to know more about anticoagulation practices, antibiotics, oxygen targets, rehabilitation, nutrition, and I'm sure there's a long list of others, but they're certainly the research priorities that we've set within uh, the international ECMO network and, um, and nationally. So challenging the status quo has included identifying barriers and facilitators to providing quality ECMO care from both consumers and clinicians, to improving processes around national auditing, reporting and training, to addressing evidence gaps with new clinical trials embedded with a national registry, and accurate reporting of costs and long-term outcomes. And I just wanted to thank my team who've been fantastic at uh, getting it set up. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol, and um, yeah, that's really challenging, the uh, actual uh, way we think about ECMO. Um, questions, comments, before everybody leaves? <laughs> it's been you, a long you, session. You, you, yeah, you have a question? No. Sorry. I think you mentioned opt-out for the consent uh, process for long-term outcome. Is it specific for ECMO? And how, how did you justify this, which, which I think is, is I, I like it very much and I think it's really important. Uh, so we have a waiver of consent for the hospital data, which was agreed by our ethics committee. They think that it's really important that we collect data and because they understand that when patients are receiving ECMO, particularly at the start of the receiving ECMO, the families are so distressed, it's a terrible time to approach them for consent. So we do approach them for consent for our interventional trial, for some of our interventional trials, but we try and minimise it. Where it's a, an intervention where we are comparing two standards of care, for example, two different oxygen levels, the ethics committee have a, again allowed us a waiver of consent even for those interventional trials. But in terms of the follow-up, because we're calling the patients, um, there's a couple of things. It involves the transfer of their data from the hospital to the university. So there's a privacy issue, so there's a legal concern. And then there's also a concern that this might be distressing for the patients or a burden on the patients and they may not want to participate. So they have to be given the opportunity to opt out. Um, and that's really easy. Um, the, the hospital actually calls them to follow up and they really like doing that. So our research coordinators at each hospital will ring the patient and just say, how are you? You know, great, so great that you've made it home or wherever they happen to be. Um, would be interested in, you know, asking you a few more questions about how your, your recovery. Would you be prepared? And almost every ECMO patient is prepared to participate. This is a particularly fabulous group for follow-up compared to every other group of patients that I follow up, which is a large number. The ECMO patients are the most willing to give back their time um, and they really love having a chat. So, um, you know, be prepared to be on the phone for a little bit. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Do you do any, like, uh, because you, the, the, in the first part, you, you mentioned a process which is really uh, aiming at improving the quality, right, and safety. Uh, so do you do like uh, morbidity, mortality reviews? Yeah, we do. Yeah. Uh, so we do that in several different ways. So we give direct feedback to the sites via the reports. We also have every patient who um, has moderate to severe disability on discharge, um, sorry, at six months, we report that back to the sites so that they can actually group their patients together and have a look at a group of patients who've had not just not just the patients who've died, but then the patients who also have significant disability, they can look at them together. So they tend to do um, morbidity meetings around that. Um, on top of that, we have presentations. Um, so for example, uh, within, Victor with, within Victoria, the Victorian hospitals all meet together and they take it in turns to do a case presentation on, each, on a particular patient. And within that particular patient, they will often ask us for the data and the long-term outcome data, so if they've survived. So that means that we can provide specific patient information on, on you know, one patient or a group of patients if that's of particular interest to them. So there's lots of different ways that we, we give feedback to the sites. And any uh, advice to manage the uh, psychological issue uh, about, you know, being uh, tagged, uh, flagged for complications or... Uh 
mm -hmm. uh, the psychological issues for the patients? No, the the, the, staff. the staff. Yeah. Okay. So that's that's really dealt with in house. So you know we have provided them, and and not every site has opted in to use that. I might add. So there's some sites who don't want to have identifiers for their cannulation, which I think is a bit of a shame. I think we should all be accountable. I think it's a learning process. Everybody gets it wrong sometimes. We all make mistakes. You have to learn from it. Um, but the sites who do use it definitely use it in a closed meeting, and often that is just between the ECMO lead, um, whoever whoever the head of the ECMO service is, and the people who are training under them. Yeah. Thank you, Cara. I mean, that's fantastic. As, as you know, I'm, I, I think you're doing a fantastic job and with a great team. I was just reflecting on, you know, you're in, in putting a lot of data into this database and obviously looking at the outcome. And we've discussed this morning, uh, earlier on this morning, how difficult it is to have prognostic models. Do you think there is a way of uh, linking back to, you know, knowing what happened to that particular group of patients? finding similar characteristics to the one has been referred and see whether you can prognosticate that way through real life data. Uh. So we are very early on with our, um, we've just been funded for the biomarkers so that, that we haven't even started collecting samples yet, let alone looking at how, whether we can actually achieve the prognostication. But you know, that is our aim. We, we have funding to do this across all of our VA patients at the moment, and we're hoping to put in another grant for VV patients. Um, and I definitely think like, if any of you have listened to Carolyn Kelfi and some of the people talking about you know, phenotypes, I think that it's gonna be really important to look at phenotypes and genotypes and other information around ECMO. So we'll be working closely with Danny McCauley and other people who are working in this field um, and, and looking at that carefully. And, and some of the other things that we've been doing with the ELSO database is AI machine learning. So we've taken a large amount of data and we're trying to update the REST score and the SAVE score using sort of larger numbers of patients with some really, um, they've done, the, the um, engineers who we've been working with have done a huge amount of work cleaning the data and trying to really um, grill down into the diagnostic codes and, and use different methods of machine learning to see if we can get a more accurate you know, um, predict, predictor of, of outcome for our ECMO patients. So there's several ways we're trying to tackle it. Um, I'll be back in a year or so and I'll let you know how we go. Looking forward to that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carol.